Thank you, Stan. Stan has made it clear I have only one lecture. <laughs> and actually, it is uh, not a long lecture. I try to extend it. At Harvard, when I was uh, going to school at Harvard, some faculty members and some students used to gather at my residence in the evenings to discuss metaphysics. And they were very keen on understanding the truth as we in the Orient or in the East saw it. And they were very keen to see how we had resolved the problem of duality and oneness. How these two could coexist. That on the one hand, the entire experience of mankind is divided into positive and negative, up and down, pain and pleasure, light and darkness. It is divided in such a way that you cannot have the experience of the one without the experience of the other. Duality is so ingrained in human experience that there is nothing we know of which could be non-dual. And yet, we bring in the old Vedantic thought from the East that there is only one reality. There never has been any other. There never will be any other. There is only one truth only one reality, only one ultimate consciousness. How do we resolve these two totally contradictory experiences? So this was generally the subject which we used to discuss in the evenings. And we discussed and we discussed and spent several evenings and several months. Eventually, one of my friends, a great friend, he inspired me on many occasions. He ultimately said he at last understood what I was trying to say. So he wrote a book, at least he was writing a book, I haven't seen it published. And he wanted me to contribute a few chapters. And I told him that, you know, I only have one lecture which I give. I repeat it in different forms. How could I write chapters? I can write very little about it. He said, what about contributing one chapter to my book? He said, well, make it one chapter. I said, it will be a very short chapter. He said, how short? Uh, just a few pages? I said, no, much shorter than that. Said, just one page? I said, it'll have to be a very short page. He said, just one sentence? <laughs> I said, it'll be a very short sentence. <laughs> Will it be many words? I said, no, it'll be such a short sentence, it'll be just one word. He was surprised that I could condense the whole of my statement, the whole of my lecture into one word. And he wanted to know what that magic word was so that from there he could understand what I was trying to say. And I gave him the magic word. I said, all I have talked about, all I have expressed, all the truth I know of, all the reality I know of, all the mysticism I have learned can be expressed in one word, very difficult word to understand, very difficult word to explain, but a word we all experience, and that word is love. If love is not understood, there is no mysticism I know of. If love is not experienced, there is no spiritual path. If love is not understood, there is no understanding of God as I know it. Love is the answer, no matter what the question. You can ask any question, the answer is love. But when I say love, I am not talking of all the infatuations and the lust and greed that goes on in the name of love and all that attachments that go on in the name of love. I am talking of love as an experience where one can totally identify with another. Love in which the separateness can disappear. Even one instantaneous nanosecond of an experience of love for someone, which so fixes the beloved in your heart so fixes the beloved in your mind that you forget yourself. You do not know if you exist. That's love. And that is the answer to the spiritual quest. That what is making us separate from truth and reality is the mind that cannot understand love, that cannot experience love, that cannot express love, and yet can understand separateness and wants to look at everything separately. I said love. And our mind quickly sees, let me look at it. The mind must become a separate examiner, a separate observer of what we are studying. It can never be the observation. It can never be the truth. 
supposing the truth is one and cannot be split and the mind cannot be the subject of study it has to be the student and the subject has to be separate the mind can never know the truth or the reality that's a fact of life that the mental apparatus that we use the logic that we use the reasoning that we use is incapable of understanding what the truth is the best contribution that intellect and mind can make to an understanding of the truth is i can't understand it when the mind says this is beyond me it has gone as far as it can in understanding the truth when the mind if it is very sharp very clever very smart it can not only express helplessly i can't understand it it says wow i can understand my own limitation i can understand that i have to operate in a certain framework which constitutes the mind that i have to operate in a time space causation framework and without that there is no mind that the mind itself creates this framework that if the framework is taken away the mind disappears when the mind can see this picture and the mind can see its own shackles and its own limitations and seeing those limitations can say because of these limitations the truth lies beyond me that is an even greater contribution the mind can make the mind cannot make a greater contribution than understanding its own limitation but if the mind says no i am more powerful than people estimate i am more powerful than you estimate i can analyze and find the answers to everything a challenge to the mind that analysis means breaking up and something that cannot be broken up how can you understand it how can you analyze something that has no beginning no middle no end that cannot be broken that cannot be seen in parts that cannot be seen in stages that cannot be seen as cause and effect that cannot be seen in any form of a split identity what can the mind do it is beyond the mind therefore the truth which these great mystics the great masters have revealed to us not by analysis not by thinking about it not by intellectualizing but by personal realization by personal experience by going within consciousness and finding the truth why they were conscious and how consciousness creates an experience or whatever they are conscious of do we have any experience of which can be absolutely certain that it is there people see things and they say yes we can see something we can see a cup of water here but even in a dream we see a cup of water and we wake up to find it wasn't there it was created by the dream people have hallucinations and they see the same cup of water and tell us we are seeing it and others can't see how can seeing of a thing be proof it is there what it proves is if one can see a cup of water all it is proving is that you are seeing a cup of water it does not prove the cup of water is there experience proves only the experience not the thing experienced and this is where we get jammed into the great maya the great illusion the grandest illusion which the vedas described 10000 years ago and very good uh, transcripts very good translations of the vedas exist in the widener library right out here in cambridge in fact that's where i first read them that maya or illusion the grand illusion under which we are suffering is not that the world is unreal and we take it as real that is not the grand illusion the grand illusion the human observer is suffering from is that what it experiences it takes at more than experience what it experiences it takes as real beyond the experience it experiences a world and therefore it says the world exists even if you are not experiencing it that's the grand illusion stay with the experience stay with truth stay with the statement if i can see a cup i am seeing a cup why do you want to go beyond that and say i am seeing a cup therefore the cup must be there even if i turn my head around the truth is the cup is not there when you turn your head around when you turn your head back it is there the experience is real but not the things of experience and the grand illusion is what creates all this world to be so real and incidentally creates unhappiness and problems and worries is that we do not take the experience as real we start taking the things of experience as real and 
as the things look beautiful and attractive and draw us, we start getting attached to those things. We start desiring more of those things. Experiences evolve in order to fulfill those desires. Because experiences in consciousness, and they are all conscious experiences. They are not experiences we know of of any other kind. They are either sensory experiences through senses, physical senses, astral senses where we are not using any physical organs but we are still experiencing such as dream or imaginations or they can be causal experiences like pure thought about a thing or they can be spiritual experiences like experience of love, intuition, sudden knowledge but they are all experiences. There is nothing objectively being proved. Some people say, well you are going too far now. We can objectively prove things. If you see a cup and you say you are only uh, seeing it because you are seeing it and it's not really there. You can touch it and see. There it is. Why don't you use your other senses? That's a pretty good argument. It is like telling a man who's dreaming. In the dream he sees a cup of water and he says, I am seeing a cup of water but I am sure it's a dream. He says, of course not. Touch it. In the dream he touches. He says, oh yeah, it's real. And he wakes up and found neither was the cup real nor was the touch real nor were those people real who told him to touch it. The whole thing was a dream. And the only way to know it was a dream was to wake up, not by touching it. Not by verifying one sense experience with another. That doesn't prove reality. Only wakefulness to a higher level of consciousness could give the experience that the whole set of experiences at one level, including the so-called verification of its reality, was part of the same dream and therefore part of the same illusion. Such is our state here now. When people rise to a higher level of consciousness, they understand how the lower level was created in the first place. It was not created by an outside material physical creation, which then went inside their sensory perception into the brain and was picked up there. It came because consciousness experienced it by a pattern within itself. And then it flowed out through the brain, through the senses and became a reality outside. And the great illusion was that it was outside and we picked it up, not that it was inside and therefore it went outside. How do we resolve this issue? This is a question asked again and again. What is the causal direction of experience, of human experience? Are we having experience because something stimulates that experience outside and comes to us and therefore we receive it? Or are we having experience because the experience is generated in consciousness and then takes place like it would if it were to come out from outside? Scientists who are like observers in the dream, they come up with explanations and say, you can study the sensory system. Take the cup of water again. The cup of water absorbing certain light and re reflecting the rest throws near parallel rays of light into your eye. We can see the with other apparatus, we can see the light being reflected. And we can also see by putting the kind of microscopes we now have on your eye, that these are being diverted. These rays are being diverted. They are being directed, focused on the back of your eye, on the retina. And we can clearly see all the rods and cones on the optic nerve that are spread out as the retina. Picking up the message, we can even see the stimuli on the retina being carried by the optic nerve and we can with a brain scanner even go up and see which part of the brain it has reached and we can see that when it reaches there, there's the rub. If you are conscious, you see the cup. What if you are not conscious? The rest is all taking place but you don't see the cup. So they end up saying that the cause of seeing the cup is the cup, the objective material cup and this flows through the nervous system, the optic nerve in this particular case, to the brain cells responsible for seeing and it is from there that consciousness picks it up. If consciousness is not sitting there to pick it up and you are dead, you can't see it. But if consciousness is sitting there, then it picks it up. Alright, let us make a few assumptions to study what they are saying. Supposing we are born with extraordinary retina the retina behind the eye can create its own image. Let us assume that the rods and cones have the ability, like several other parts of the body have ability. And we are studying more and more and getting surprised 
what abilities like antibodies have, the kind of uh, new studies going on to study AIDS have revealed new messages about the working of the body we never knew, that there are certain parts of the body sitting invisibly and they come up and become visible and they are ready. Uh, uh, the other day I heard a lecture on uh, fat and fitness, there is a book on fat and fitness and uh, the author was telling how it is not enough to diet to lose fat, it is not enough to do exercise to lose fat. You must develop a pattern so that your consciousness itself gives a suggestion, is ready, the mind itself is ready to say I am going to do exercise and the, the messages pass at that time before you start exercise, the fat is released and starts getting burnt. So they have found new things that are happening in the body we never knew before. Supposing the retina of the eye has this facility to form its own pictures and forms the picture of this cup and both retinas form the picture of the cup. The rest of the steps are identical, I will see the cup exactly as I am seeing it now. There is absolutely no question about it because there is nothing else to add on to that for seeing the cup. The only means I had to see the cup was the picture on the retina. The retina can make the picture, I will see the cup exactly as I am seeing now. There is no way. Not only that, any kind of microscope introduced to examine the seeing of the cup will show all the steps and all the scanning that has been done will show exactly what happened earlier with the no conclusive evidence whether the retina had the power or the cup really existed. Forget that part. Let's say that it's not the retina that has the power. It's the optic nerve. The optic nerve has the power to generate those signals. If it does, it will create the same picture on the retina and give the same message to the brain and the cup will be seen exactly as it is. If you go a step further and say let us forget that the optic nerve has any power, it is only the brain that works. If the brain cell responds exactly as it would respond if the nerves had sent the message, it will send the contrary opposite message to the nerve, create the image on the retina and we will see the cup exactly as it is. Go one step further, let us assume the body has no such function but the consciousness that picks up the message from the brain, that alone has the power and flexibility to create an image and it creates this image, the brain picks up and gets the same changes in a structure, the molecular structure, the same message is sent through the optic nerve, the same hap thing happens on the retina and we see the cup exactly as we are seeing now. Where is the proof? What is the causal direction of experience? Is consciousness creating experience or is consciousness picking up experience? Well, these learned philosophers say that's not a very difficult question. You are again talking of cause and effect. You are saying what is the cause, what is the effect? Is the experience a cause of the things or are things the cause of the experience? That's very easy to prove. Whatever comes first must be the cause. What happens later must be the effect. Okay, we'll take this cup away, you don't see it. We are putting this cup in front of you, you can see it. Obviously the cup is the cause and you're seeing of it is the effect. And this is again going back to the dream state. In the dream a person wants to convince me the cup is not a dream but is real and takes it away and then puts it back again and says not a dream because now you can see it. When I wake up I found neither the cup was real, it was still a dream nor were those people real. When I am examining the nature of vision, how can I then rely upon an evidence of another visionary source like a person telling me if the cup is there or not or removing it or not removing, that's a great fallacy. Is it possible for me without evidence of people at the same level of consciousness? Is it possible from my own consciousness to know if I am creating the cup or I am seeing the cup? If I look at it closely from my own experience and each one of you look at your own experience, you will find that the experiencing of the cup and the seeing or knowing the cup is there have taken place simultaneously with no gap of time at all. It has never happened that first you know the cup is there then you see it or first you see the cup and then it comes. They are both at the same time. Therefore, leaving no room for an explanation on a causal basis, whether the consciousness creates the experience or the experience is creating consciousness of it, we get stuck here and no amount of mental jugglery, no amount of mental speculation or intellectual 
consideration and give an answer to this question. But there is a way. And that is where the masters step in. The masters who have meditated within consciousness, who know the nature of consciousness, they give an answer. And they give an answer not based on speculation or study or scholarship. They give an answer based upon their meditation. They give an experience based upon their introspection. They give an answer on a very simple basis. When we were confronted with this problem, what is the nature of consciousness? And when they study the anatomy of consciousness, they come up with a direct realization by withdrawing their attention from the cup to consciousness. It's a great step they take. Very important because we have never done it. We have always put our attention on things. From birth till death, we do nothing else. Nobody taught us anything else. People told us, put your attention on things outside of yourself. Don't put your attention where the attention is coming from. Put your attention on what is in front of you. Little babies are born. They are still so little. Their eyes are not opening. They just open little eyes and they go shut that to watch the drama they are watching inside. And they smile and they laugh at what they are doing. And we open their eyes and put the rattle. See out here. Come out. Come out. Where are you? We draw them out from that age onwards. And the rest of the world is busy drawing us out till we die. We never got a chance to examine where did we put our attention from in the first place? These are exceptional people. They are rare people who say, instead of putting your attention on the cup to understand if it is the cause or the effect of consciousness, put your attention on consciousness. Why not give equal chance to both sides? Withdraw your attention instead of focusing your attention. Don't focus your attention on a thing. Withdraw your attention from the very thing you have been focusing it on all your life. When you withdraw attention, and when we try to withdraw attention, we know, don't know how to do it. People who first go and become students and disciples of these great masters, they have a very hard time. They say, Master, you say, withdraw attention. Where should we focus now? He say, we are not talking of focusing attention. We are telling you to withdraw attention. Master, withdraw from where? Okay, withdraw from the cup. Okay, now I'm going to focus on a single point. How does that help? If you shift the focusing of attention from the cup to another point, you are still focusing out from the point from where it is origi originating. Why can't you withdraw attention to consciousness, which was the recipient of all the impulses that created experience for you? When you withdraw your attention back, so they make simple techniques. They have evolved simple techniques. And to the surprising amazement of students, of spiritual masters and their lives and their teachings. It has been singularly uniform and consistent what they have taught. The teachings have been so similar that they have told us methods how we can withdraw attention to consciousness, to our own self. Because if self is consciousness and if consciousness is the ultimate experiencer, the best way to find the self would be to withdraw attention there. Put the attention there to your own self and see what the self is like. They teach simple methods of withdrawal of attention. And when we withdraw attention there, we discover that that consciousness is not only holding the picture of this cup, it is holding the picture of the cup we will see tomorrow. Surely that's strange. We don't believe tomorrow has come yet. How could the picture of tomorrow be there already? So when we come out and tomorrow comes in the same way as we saw, then we know that what we are seeing is a replay. It's not future what we are seeing. It's a replay. The whole thing is recorded, pre-recorded. That the pre-recording is done in some strange form in an area we call our own consciousness. It is not recorded somewhere else. It's certainly not recorded outside of the self. It is not recorded in the sky. Certainly not this sky. It's certainly not recorded in this space. It is recorded in a space and sky inside our consciousness. And we saw it. Once you see it, you have to see it only once, momentarily. You know what it's all about. After that, at least this problem is solved. You have no doubt left. Nobody can create doubt in your mind how experience is being generated. That you are generating the experience from consciousness. As you spend more time exploring your own self, 
as you spend more time understanding your own consciousness, you also begin to understand why did you create a cup? Why not a teapot? Or something else, whatever you like. Or a pretty, pretty piece of, well, that's your idea. <laughs> what I am suggesting is, what set in motion a pattern of experience? Why was life like it was? What triggers off life? And we are born at a certain place. We grow up at a certain place. We meet people. If it is all being generated from inside, we have marriages, children, growth, old age, sickness, pain, pleasure. We have all the experiences of ups and downs and then we die. If all this is being created from consciousness, why did we, if we are the creators, pick up this experience? Anybody I have asked, did you like the life you created? They said, no, no, not again. If that is so, why did we do it? You have to stay further and go deeper into your own self to find out what part of consciousness creates the pattern that constitutes human life. When we go deeper, we find it is not the senses. This seeing of the cup is only a sensory function. Touching of the cup is a sensory function. Smelling and tasting is all a sensory function. All these functions that we have with the senses only constitute the first stage, the peripheral stage of our own consciousness. It's not our real self. It is actually as unreal as this body. It is only an inner body, a separate invisible body. It's a body of senses. It's a body we use every day. If I took, take the cup away and hide it, you can still see it, but not with the physical eyes. You can still see it with what you call your imaginary eyes. Where are those imaginary eyes? Where are you seeing the cup? I bring it back, you can now see it with the physical eyes also. Which, what eyes were you seeing? Those eyes are called astral eyes or sensory eyes or eyes that can function without the need of the physical eyes. All senses can function without the physical body. And we use them all the time, calling it imagination, fantasizing, all kinds of words we give it. But we are using the sense perceptions all the same. All senses we are using. Those senses are being used by us from a part of a covering of our own self which is beneath this physical cover. And therefore, because it operates in conjunction with the physical body, we attribute these senses to the physical body. Actually, they are quite independent. When we withdraw our attention from the cup and stay long enough at the point where we think the consciousness is actually sitting and operating from, if we withdraw and sit there peacefully long enough not to know where the physical body is, if we can forget our physical body and be there, then we can see that we are as real in the sensory body alone as we thought we were with the physical body. That the so-called sensory body can step away and look back and say, boy, this physical body I thought was me. And you just walked out of it. And you can walk back into it and get up as if not knowing what is the reality anymore. It is a dangerous experience to be able to walk out of the body and walk into the body and not know which one was real. The point I'm making is that little momentary experience can convince you that the physical body is not your reality. And the sensory body looks like reality. But when the sensory body looks like reality and you can step back into physical or sensory, the sensory looks more real. Because when you are in the sensory body without the physical, it doesn't have the same date of birth. In this body, you can know how old you are. The film actress Cher talking the other, Cher, is that the thing? In fitness program, she's doing more fitness program. She was talking of a very valuable lesson she learned once, how to remain fit. And she said the knowledge that, the knowledge that we are old makes us old. And she said, if people forgot their dates of birth, they would all become young. It is the knowledge of the date of birth that makes us old. When we shift our astral body or sensory body away from the physical, we have no knowledge of the date of birth. We are young. Looks like we have been young forever. We can remember things in that form, which are not connected with the date of birth of the physical body. And therefore, there is no correlation, but that looks more real. For the simple reason, it has definitely outlived this body in birth and possibly in death. This little experience makes that form of our own self more real. But that is as unreal as this one. 
as we will presently find. Supposing we stay within consciousness of the astral body. The astral body gives us no clue why we decided to have such a painful and terrible life as we are having. If we created from consciousness this life, why did we pick up this bad package? It gives us no clue. So we have to go within that form to consciousness operating in the sensory body. And when we withdraw attention, not from, the, not from physical objects to the senses, but from senses to consciousness, when we withdraw attention, we discover that we have a form which can step out of the sensory body as easily as we can step out of the physical to go into the astral. That our form is not really the sensory body. We can leave all the senses aside. We don't need them. The senses don't constitute reality for us. That it is the mind that picks up the senses that makes reality. And we can really bodily shift the mind out of the sensory body and watch the senses as we did the physical body. When we watch our senses separated from us, we realize we were not senses anyway. That was not real. That we are really the mental self that absorbed the senses. Therefore, our body was really the mind. That mind was our real self. That's what we discovered. When we discover that stage in introspection and meditation, we also come to know that the mind is holding a long pattern of experiences. That this life which we thought was the only life we had. And we had no memory, no information of previous lives. That this was hung up as one life on a string of lives. At that point, one can go back in regression. And have a look at one's past as far back as one wants. One lifetime, two lifetimes, ten lifetimes, hundred lifetimes, thousand lifetimes. And can look forward into the future what one is getting. One lifetime, two lifetimes, ten lifetimes, twenty lifetimes ahead. At that time, one realizes that the life we were replaying or living through, which we thought we created, was not created in isolation. That we didn't pick up who we will meet and who we will do and what, who we will hurt and who will hurt us and who we will please and who will please us was not done in isolation for one lifetime. It was a chain reaction that all this was happening in a cause and effect chain. We hurt somebody way back in one lifetime. And that person comes up in a new relationship and hurts us back now. We hurt that person now willfully and goes back in the future and we can see when it will be punished or rewarded later. All these are connected. That there is no event, there is no part of the program that is working independently. That the whole line of reincarnations, the whole line of experiences of human forms are interconnected by cause and effect. And this is what they call karma. The law of karma is the law of cause and effect. As you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you have done, you are reaping now. This program, this particular package of life has not come by itself. It has come by your own actions which you can see and remember. To your own satisfaction. You don't need anybody else's proof. You don't need a psychic to tell you where you were. All you need is to go within your own self and see what you were, what you did, why this is happening now. So although it is all created from consciousness, it was not created only for one lifetime. It was created for a whole chain of lifetimes. In the epic scripture, Mahabharata, in I don't know how many of you have heard of that, Mahabharata is one of the epics in which uh, one blind king can remember previous lives. In, in Sanskrit, in the original, it is written that when he was able to remember his lives, he looked back on 100 lives and he saw he had never done anything to be blind. So he got very concerned that this law is not operating properly because I did nothing and still blind. What kind of law is it? And everybody says the law is the one that prevails, this law. This law is so inviolate that it operates almost automatically. This law that is always prevailing, why didn't it prevail in my case? So he asked Krishna, who is the avatar? who is the, uh, the, the incarnation of Vishnu in that epic story, Krishna, and he talks to Arjun, and then Krishna is asked by him, Dhritarashtra, the blind king, I have seen 100 lives of my own in my previous, in my meditation, of my previous 100 lives, I have done nothing to be blind. How come the law is not prevailing anymore? Krishna laughs and says, go back further. So he goes to 104th life, 
and he finally did something. He shot out the eyes with an arrow of one of the animals he was hunting. And that stayed on the record and did not come back till this life when he was a king. So a life is not picked up exactly like a carbon copy of the previous life. It picks up its elements from so many lives. And since all that we do cannot be accommodated in one lifetime, it is kept in reserve, which is called the sinchit. A reserve of this causal sky, not this sky, not the astral sky, not the sensory sky. The causal sky, where the mind alone is the body, where the mind alone is the self. And that holds all these elements of our own past actions. And from there they are picked up and a package is prepared for one lifetime. So he saw that even after 104 lives, he could still come and pay off by being a blind person. We do not interpret the Bible like that. But people are sometimes puzzled. I remember at Harvard, people were puzzled by the statement there when a father brings his blind child to Jesus and says, Master, this child is born blind. Is it the fault of the child? Is it the sin of the child? Or is it the sin of the father that he is born blind? And Jesus answers, no, it is neither his sin nor his father's sin. It is that the law may prevail. And people say, what law? What law may prevail? Of course, the Easterners understood it immediately. What law will prevail? Because they had heard the story even before the Bible was written. These stories are recorded in the Upanishads and the Vedas much before Jesus came. And the same law they are talking of again and again. That the law may prevail. It's not one lifetime separate. These born blind child, what has he done to deserve it? A child born in luxury and riches. What has he done to deserve it? A child born in poverty, what has he done to deserve that? This is not the child's current life and his current efforts to do something. It is a reward and punishment of a long chain of events. Can you be sure of these things or are these speculations? The masters say, don't accept any of this in speculation. One of the fundamental teachings of the perfect masters is, don't accept anything on blind faith. Go within and see it for yourself and see your own self and see your own chain and understand what's going on. If we are clever enough and uh, intense enough to meditate in such a way as to go within, follow all the instructions that these masters give to find out our own reality, why things are happening to us the way they are happening. If we are that strong that we find the answers for ourselves, so what? How does pain and suffering end just by knowing they are going to be pain and suffering? That doesn't help too much. A lot of people go to astrologers. They say, tell me, what's going to happen? A good astrologer will say, well, things will take a turn and, you know, things will be better. A truthful astrologer will say, this thing will go on happening again, my dear. You can do nothing. We don't need truthful astrologers. If, if we meet a truthful astrologer, we run to find a good astrologer. We pay more fees. We don't want to hear that. We know it already. We have seen enough ourselves. These ups and downs of life has messed us up so much. We want to hear some good words, some encouragement. There's going to be some turn, some sunshine somewhere, some light coming out. We don't want to hear the truth. The truth is within us. We want to hear something to keep us going. The fact of the matter is, that the astrologer can tell you what will happen. He cannot change what will happen. If he could change what's going to happen, we would run after such an astrologer. All these yogis of India, famous yogis, rishis, maharishis, mahayogis, grand yogis, all of them who went to the highest stages. Of course, most of them didn't. Most of these yogis just told you how to develop your energies in the six centers below. You can have energy, you can have out-of-body experiences, linked to the silver cord, you have to run back, otherwise you die, and death is real in this physical body. They couldn't go beyond that. They just gave you strange, exotic experiences. They told you how you can fly, or have the experience of flying or levitation that you are not touching the ground. I met many of them. At one time, I was fascinated by them. Later on, I found it's better to find an American Airlines ticket instead of... <laughs> What's the difference? That's all we're looking for. They don't give you truth. They don't give you any knowledge. They give you kicks. They give you rides. That's all. You can have all kinds of rides. But these yogis 
who went above the six chakras, above the six centers of energy and took us into areas of pure consciousness. Only the highest, uh, highest of them took us to the causal region, to the region of the universal mind, to the Akashic records where everything was recorded from beginning to end, where every life of ours was recorded and we could see the past, present and future. They took us to those highest. I once again point out to you, rarely have we come across a person whom we call a perfect living master, PLM for short. <laughs> a perfect living master who can take us beyond the, beyond the area where this karma is created. These perfect living masters who are dealing with consciousness, not the experience of consciousness. Who are dealing with the soul that lives, not the life it leads. Who are dealing with the soul that will live 1000 lives, not the 1000 lives. Who are looking at the reality of the experiencer, and not the experience. These deep mystics who could go beyond experience into the experiencer, they discovered that if you go within your own self and not get trapped by the continuum of lives, you can really skip the whole apparatus that creates the lives. They found out that what creates this linear time sequence of lives is the mind. That the mind is not the self. The mind is not our self. Mind is not consciousness. Mind is using consciousness and becoming real. That the mind that creates will, mind that creates karma, mind that creates action, mind that bears up the fruit of that action, mind that is responsible for the whole law of karma, the whole law that the mind itself is an obstruction to self-realization. Those were rare mystics, very rare. You would find those books very rare where they said that this whole business of good and bad, the whole business of choice, the whole business of past and present and future, the whole business of cause and effect, all this business fits only into time. That if time were not there, you would have none of this stuff. That mind thrives on time, space and causation. Therefore, mind is not the answer to find an escape from the system. Even if there are millions of lifetimes already stored in the back and millions of lifetimes ahead of you, you cannot escape by changing those lifetimes. You may cut them short by a few million, they are still a few million. In fact, the horizon there is infinite because we have created infinity. That's one of the big advantages of creating limited time. Every time you create a limited time, you create infinity along with it. Beyond that limited time is infinity. Therefore, you can never end time once you create it. Once we got into a mental region, once we got into the region of a universal mind, we were trapped into time which is infinite. We can neither get out of it by going to the beginning or to the end because in this kind of time there is no beginning and no end. It's continuous. These perfect living masters discovered that to get out of this big trap, the biggest trap, a trap much bigger than the Maya of this universe, an illusion much greater than the illusion of this world being real or unreal. An illusion that traps you into infinite kind of rebirths. An illusion that traps you into time from which you cannot escape. To get out of this illusion, the solution is still the same, but very few people know it because they cannot pierce it. The solution is go within your own self, your own consciousness. Don't regard that mind as yourself. Go within the mind and find what consciousness without time is doing to create this experience in mind. And when you go within and discover that mind or the thinking faculty or the faculty that creates cause and effect is just a cover, you can step out of it like you step out of this body in the astral form. That the mind was nothing more than a body. That the mind was nothing more than a cover. And you can step out of it and step back into it like you stepped out of this in the astral form and got back into the physical, that the mind was not yourself. They were able to not only prove to their own satisfaction by experience, they helped through the techniques they themselves used, their own disciples, to have the experience of transcending the mind and finding their true self, a consciousness, a soul, a spirit that was not bound down by time. A spirit for which a moment or an infinity were identical. 
a spirit which could see the entire structure of millions and trillions of lives in one flash. That kind of consciousness. When they discovered that the true nature of the human consciousness was so different from what we had been assuming, they wanted to share it with others. They wanted to share that experience and exploration with their disciples. There were very few disciples who were ready for it. There were very few disciples ready even for the first stage. This was way ahead advanced, advanced, super advanced course for their disciples. So they decided to pick up those who were ready. So they looked at the experiences of all these floating souls in this universe, created universe. Where were these souls floating? And some had gone through this round so many times that this love and compassion, which was natural to the soul, did not have to be cultivated. Just like reasoning was natural to the mind. Just like seeing and hearing was natural to the senses. Just like physically sitting down and feeling weight was natural to the body on this planet. Similarly, love and intuition and beauty was natural to the soul. In that love and compassion, which was natural to their own being at that time, they looked around and saw how these souls, afflicted by the mind and attacked by the mind and going round and round in circles in this whole creation, were suffering so much out of compassion. They picked up some, said, no, this one deserves to come out of the cycle, has had enough. This is too much. And they said, in any case, these souls are not separated. It's only a separate experience created by the mind. They are not separate. They are one with the creator. They have always been one with the creator. They are not really separate, but they are having an experience of separateness. They should be picked up. And from that came the great event of that power which is the creator itself landing in our midst in the human form and having what are now called marked sheep or marked souls for a shepherd. That they picked up those who were destined to go and have that experience of the inner flight beyond mind and they were picked up as marked souls marked because of the experiences they have had over several lifetimes. And that karma was considered to be so good, even if you are suffering. But the total accumulation of karma till now was so great that you could come across your shepherd, your master, for whom you were a marked soul. That is a great experience. That is why these marked souls in the course of their same lifetime, through which they were going through ups and downs and not knowing what to do, they began to develop in their hearts a seeking for something that they could not see, a seeking for truth, a seeking for a reality they could not understand with their mind. And when that seeking grew, they said, there must be something more. And while they were doing this in their own heart, in their own selves, sometimes talking to their friends, sometimes not talking, not to be misunderstood by their friends, and just passing life, feeling nobody understands fully what's happening in their heart, while they were doing this, by a coincidence, comes along a person. They look and say, how has he got the answers to the questions I haven't even asked him? How can he touch me in that part of my soul, which I have never been able to explain to anybody? How come he can contact me at that point where even my most beloved friends cannot reach? How come my love with these people in this world was skin deep? And here comes one who touched me deep in the spirit. They can't understand it, how it happened. They don't know the business of marked sheep and marked souls. They don't know they are marked. And one who comes now, an utterly ordinary human being, for that individual is not an utterly ordinary human being. Because for that individual, that person who comes at that time in life is the one who represents the consciousness of the seeker in the highest form. And therefore, it is that person who then brings up the subject of spirituality brings up going within, introduces true meditation, takes one beyond the pale of the karma, beyond the pale of mind, beyond beginnings and ends, beyond any law of ethics or morality, beyond choice into the region of love, joy, beauty, intuition, total knowledge. Such a person, when he comes, he is not regarded by everybody as that great person who, can, who has contact with the highest level of consciousness. Some people say he's just a charlatan. Some people even want to kill him and actually do. 
some people kill these people because they say they are they are uh, messing up with the lives of people they are uh, uh, misleading people some people say they are the satan devil some people use some excuse to kill them because that affects their business but the person who is marked as a sheep says this could not be an ordinary happening how come i am getting answers to my questions which i had hidden in my heart for so long because i knew nobody can understand them how come i am now being touched by my own self how come i can go within my own self and have a feeling of who i am such people are actually plms perfect living masters such people are in fact perfect living masters for the marked souls they have come and appeared in our experience for the sake of those marked souls when they have done their job and they picked up their marked souls they go disappear nobody sees them we remember them then we build up big monuments for them then we say we know what they taught and then we start teaching them and we know nothing about what they taught because they did not teach like ordinary teachers they taught us from within our own self they revolutionized our own consciousness from within not from outside we go and listen to them and we say wow they are explaining the truth second time we go and listen to them wow they are not explaining the truth they are the truth third time we go boy truth is love they are full of love fourth time we go we don't care who they are <laughs> so long as we can get some time it is different kind of teaching altogether it is not the kind of thing we are used to it's not the mental teaching we are accustomed to this is a spiritual experience taking place inside us not outside of us yet these are the very people who become the only catalysts that can bring us in touch with the light within our own self otherwise it's all darkness the reason why we don't meditate is when we close our eyes it's dark when we meet these people meditation changes when we close our eyes we can see light but they have come to show the light not come to lead us into darkness they come to take us into light these are the perfect living masters who then take us to a region of our own level of consciousness within our own self which is beyond mind and therefore beyond karma and therefore beyond the cycle of birth and rebirth at that time one can turn around and say master you did a good job the master says we did a good job we are not different we just playing a game it's the self playing a game of two even the duality is not ended yet but it's the same consciousness that is playing the whole game then we have a right to ask a question master if this is our reality that we are in fact love and beauty and joy and spirit and soul and our consciousness consists only of these beautiful qualities of so much rejoicing so much happiness how come we chose as as the creator we chose to go into that mess why did we do it why was it necessary to go back into that from where we then had to escape and come back here at least now we can look back why did we do it the master can give a very easy answer he says first of all you never went you just dreamt about it you don't mind dreaming too much well master i don't mind dreaming i know it was not real because really i was still here all the time i was really in reality all the time i just dreamt i just had an illusion i had a feeling a delusion that i was there but it was a nightmare just terrible i don't like such dreams why did i have to dream so bad why did i have to have such an ugly dream the master says precisely so that you can now say what a wonderful place this is to be in had you not had that dream you would never have sung these songs of praise for where you are where you always have been you always been here you yourself designed in consciousness and experience to enhance the beauty of where you always have been you never left you only designed an experience to enhance the consciousness of where you always have been the consciousness of the truth the consciousness of permanency is enhanced by a little inter intermission of a consciousness of delusion which had pain and suffering with it therefore you have really come out of nothing you have only come out of the feeling that i can take this bliss for granted you did not want to take the bliss for granted you made it real you made your concurrent bliss which was always there in heaven for you in your true home for you into a very active bliss 
They say, what about the other souls? All of us didn't go into this experience. Let me look around. So billions of souls all dancing and singing and enjoying. They never left heaven. They didn't want to go into this experience of mind and choices and evil and good and reincarnation and life after life and getting trapped into those miserable things and then have to come back. They never left. In some of the scriptures describing the state of spirit or soul as it experiences individuation in its creator. Within the creator, when the spirit experiences being an individual soul, there are the souls that have had this experience of delusion of this creation. And there are souls that have never had that experience. In the text, it is called Hans, the one who has had that experience, and Buns who had not had that experience. So the Bunses are just singing in a robotic way, and they are having very good time. And these Hanses are jumping with joy and leaping. And the Bunses say, what's happened to you? You are the ones who told us you went into suffering. Why are you leaping more than us? Why are you singing louder than us? And they say to the Bunses, the souls who have never left, their father's home. You don't know what you're missing right now. If you had seen what we've seen, you would know what you're getting now. So now we realize that in a small dreamlike experience, we were able to enhance the happiness which we were getting right where we always have been. We never left this place. It all happened here. It all happened in delusion in consciousness. But the way it happened has brought us back. This kind of experience looks so fairy tale like this looks like a Cinderella story. This looks so much a fantasy. And yet the perfect living masters say, go within and verify. And don't believe anybody's word. Don't even believe the word of the guru. Don't even believe the word of your master on this issue. Go within and verify and check it out for yourself. Then only believe it. That has been one of the greatest difference between all these evangelists and all these preachers who have come and promised things in the future and the perfect living masters who have come and said, verify it right now while you are here. Don't wait for dying and seeing something. Die while you are living. Then you will be able to verify. While you are in this body, experience what we are talking about. Know from where we come. Know from where we are talking. And see it within yourself. Then come and tell us, are we telling the truth or not? There's been a big difference. Therefore, the secret of these perfect living masters, when they come to us, is that they give us something which is verifiable, something that we can prove to ourselves, something we can experience ourselves. I have come and shared this with you because I was so fortunate. I can't imagine any great, greater fortune in my life or anybody's life for that matter than finding a perfect living master. I found a perfect living master, so I thought actually a perfect living master found me. And the perfect living master showed me the way. And I wanted to argue about it. And I wanted to compare it. He said, go ahead. He told me to compare. I said, it may be an accident I met you. <clears throat> Maybe there's another one hiding in the mountains, in the caves, in the Himalayas, who would say something better than you have said. He said, sure, go ahead. I went to the caves. I went to the Himalayas. I met more masters of various kinds than anybody else I know of in my life. And I wondered if, if different masters in this planet and if there was a spaceship going to Mars or any other place, I would go there too to see if some hidden masters there are teaching something else. Whatever I found out now, and I have just passed my retirement age, 65, in this life where I'm supposed to be retired, though I make still cookies, some, some of these cookies, I have found that what the perfect living master told me holds true. The method he told me is a natural method. He did not invent it. He did not create it. The same creator created the method who created us. The same creator who made us human created the method to escape from the misery of this human life. That the method was within us, not outside. That we don't have to go anywhere. That the true church, the true temple, the true house of God is this body. That whatever you want to discover must be discovered within the body. That all scriptures are correct if you read them at the different levels of consciousness from where they are written and to which they are making a reference. That there are no contradictions in any religions. That the contradictions are being created by the mind which cannot see beyond the mind. That if you were able to study what is love, if you were able to experience love, contradictions would disappear. That love is a phenomenon that changes you automatically. That love is something you don't cultivate. 
that comes when you reach a certain level beyond the mind. That the thinking mind is messing you up more than anything else. All this knowledge came up not by study. In fact, I was a very uneducated man till I came to the United States. Then I read a lot of books because people began to quote page numbers. <laughs> Have you seen that this is recorded on page so and so? I had to run, buy a book and see the page number. But once somebody surprised me, when he quoted, he said, why do you always talk of the third eye center? That's what I was taught, it worked. I thought it's fair to share that meditation must be done at a proper place. People were meditating. It was a big, it was a big movement in the United States, in the 60s. People were meditating. And every time I asked, where do you meditate? They said, we have a special corner in our house. We have a special rug we brought from Tibet. We have a special thing with the candle lights. They all referred to physical things. I said, is that where you do meditation? How can you make any progress? If you put your candles and do meditation, you will always think of the candles, even with your eyes closed. If you got a nice Tibetan rug and sit on it and do meditation, the Tibetan rug will take your attention however long you sit. How can you be successful in meditation? By meditating on things that are outside. They said, what do you mean? I said, my teacher told me that to do effective, successful meditation, you must sit behind the eyes inside your head. That unless you are seated there, don't even think of starting meditation. That if you want success in this program of going within, first start by going within, by closing your eyes, imagining you are behind the eyes, knowing you are in a physical head, becoming conscious of that location, then start meditation so that your attention gets locked into your own self, not outside. How come you didn't know this? I said, my master's message worked very well. Then somebody challenged me. That's where I was uneducated, you know, because I didn't read books. They said, who was your master? I said, great master, Baba Savan Singh. Who? Oh, the one who wrote spiritual letters. Is that spiritual gems? There's a book sold here in this country called Spiritual Gems. They are letters written by the great master, my teacher. They said, how come you talk so much about this sitting inside the third eye center? Your master never mentions that. I said, I haven't read that book. Let me have a copy. So in 1962, I got hold of a copy of Spiritual Gems. And it was so fascinating. <laughs> Boy, I couldn't stop till I read the whole book. But every time the great master in one of his letters say, do not even start meditation till you sit behind the eyes at the third eye center, I put a little tick mark. Before I had gone through half the book, I had tick marked 20 places. So I said, stop it, I don't want to tick mark anymore because they thought my master never said this thing. So next day I asked that man, have you read this book? Yeah, several times. It's great. How do you use this book? I use this book like astrology. When I have a question in my mind, I open it at the right page. The answer comes. It's always right. I said, is that all you do? No wonder you never read where he says, sit behind the eyes. Because that is not part of astrology. That's part of meditation. I gave him the book. He was uh, sh shocked that he had gone through the same book so many times, and he had always missed those pages where I had made the tick marks, that the great master thought it was so important that to be successful in meditation, you must sit at the right place within your own self. In this workshop, I'd be very happy if I can encourage those who are seeking the truth just to learn this one lesson of how to sit behind the eyes and do meditation there. You can do any meditation at this stage. I don't care, because even if you sat behind the eyes and did no meditation, you would see the light. The truth is, the light is there all the time in everybody. The light is there even among good people and bad people. The light is there in all human beings, whether good, bad, virtuous, vicious, because all were made by the same creator. There's a story of, not a story, true story, of a gangster who came to Great Master. His name was Shadi. Joel likes the stories of great master. Right, Joel? So I'm repeating it here so others can also hear. There was a gangster who used to rob people and kill people. <clears throat> and he decided to rob the headquarters of the great master because he heard 
that many disciples were going to contribute gold, their gold ornaments and their gold holdings in order to gold plate the domes on top of the temple which was going to be made. He said this is a good time to have a quick pick of a lot of gold assembled at one small place. So he came on a reconnaissance mission, recce they used to call it. He came for a recce and he said, let me find out who these people are. He discovered that the great master in the evening at 5 o'clock gave a discourse, gave a lecture. And everybody used to go there. So when everybody is away, some, somebody must be left there to guard the gold. So we'll just walk around when the lecture is in progress and find out where the gold is. When he went for this recce, this robber, this gangster, when he went around, he found it as even easier than he thought. Because he, when he went there to the different homes, there were very few homes in that area at that time, he found that not only were all the people away to the discourse, they had left little, little children to guard the gold. So they, he went and asked those, one of the children, why are you here? Why haven't you gone to listen to the discourse? The child said, I am guarding the gold. He said, where is it? Right there. It was so simple. And he found that he could make a list and spot out all the gold in one short half hour round. And after his half an hour, he was ready to bring his companion gangsters on another raid one of these days and just grab all the gold while the discourse is on and go away. So he left. When he was leaving, it suddenly occurred to him. Now that's the strange part. There's something in him that said, they call him a great master. What does he teach? How can people leave their gold and run to listen to him? What is he saying after all? So out of curiosity, he decided just to go and stand at the back of the audience to listen to what he is saying. And when he came and stood at the back of the audience, at that time, great master was saying, that word, that shabad, that creative power, that created even the creator, that power is in each one of us and can be heard within us. Even gangsters have that power. He got shocked like this. He said, boy, how did he know it? How did he recognize that I was here? He couldn't move. This experience had never happened to him before. That somebody without introduction could tell who he was, that he was a gangster. He couldn't move from there. He stood there. He waited for the discourse to end and walked up to the great master and said, great master, how did you recognize me that I was a gangster? Great master said, I didn't recognize you. What made you think so? He said, when I came there, you said that great power, the power of the world, the creative power is in each one of us, including gangsters. Great master said, I say that every day. I didn't mean it for you. He said, don't play this game with me. Don't try to play this game. The more the great master acted humble and human, the more he got convinced. Now he's hiding the truth. I'm not going to go. He decided not to go. He never left the great master from that point onwards. He said, I have come to stay. I have found out something. Great master, first I thought I had come to rob you. With one word, you robbed me. And after you robbed me, I am now discovering I am still robbing you. But of a wealth much better than any gold in this world. Great master said, there is one condition. In this center of mine, you have to work to make your living. We don't allow beggars, nor thieves, nor robbers. Do you know anything by which you can earn an honest living? Because here everybody earns their honest living. And then they do spiritual work. Even though I am considered a master and people come and listen to me, I go and work on my field and make my living from there. I get my pension from the military service I did and I live on that. I have never taken anybody's donation for my personal life. Here is my jacket here. A long big jacket and an inner waistcoat, small pocket. Here small pocket contains the change of his pension. The big pocket contains donations for use in the center. I never mix them up. You can't mix up Shadi. If you have to live here, you have to work for your living in an honest way. Shadi said, I am willing to do anything. He said, what do you know? He said, I know how to rob. He said, don't you know anything else? He said, but I have never done anything else. I only know how to steal and rob at gunpoint, or at knife point, I have never learned anything else. Great master said, during the course of your career as a robber, you must have learned some other art also. He said, oh yeah, I, I had one art. In the truck in which we used to escape, the getaway truck, 
when it used to break down, I was the one who repaired the dynamo and the electrical system. Great master said, good, go and get a dynamo and start repairing it and get paid for that. So Shadi went, got a dynamo and he worked it and for the first time, an electrical lamp was lit up in the house where the great master lived. And Shadi worked on the generator and improved it and he spent his life serving the great master. And he made such rapid progress that people were annoyed with the great master. That you are giving more grace to a robber and a thief than to us holy men who are sitting at your feet for years. The great master said, they, he has no such idea that he is a holy man sitting at my feet for so long. You have this idea, so you will take longer. The more humble you are, the quicker you go. He has no such idea. He thinks he's a gangster. He's working on pure grace. And he's an intense person. He was such an intense robber, such an intense gangster. He was so single-minded, so focused on things he was doing, that when he learned that he has to focus within and go within and withdraw attention, he put the same intensity in going within and made great results out of it. And he passed all these stages and he went. He loved to go backwards and forwards in time. So great master said, yes, don't tell too many people except when I authorize you. Because then people will run after you and mess up your meditation. So one day, great master did authorize him to tell about his meeting in the past with different dignitaries where he entered the past and came back. He had a meeting. He was a Muslim, belonged to Islam. So he had a meeting with the prophet. Then he went back further and had a meeting with Christ. And he revealed how where Christ was and how he... Christ was then and where Christ was now and what his nature was. So he had a very interesting set of experiences to share with us about uh, uh, events that we knew, events that were historical. But then he became great, a great mystic himself. So that Shadi was a gangster and he came in. The point I was making is that power, that ability to go back to our own ultimate home where we belong. That word, that great current, that great current of consciousness and life that makes us capable of having experience at any level, including this. That great current is inside, not outside. That to reach it, you must go inside, not outside. That to go inside, you must start from inside. You cannot start from outside and say you will one day go inside. The starting point is the third eye center behind the eyes. The starting point is the point behind the middle of the brow. The point between the ears, behind the eyes, and when you feel you are in the center of the head. If you can sit there, if you can withdraw there, if you feel nothing else exists but you there, you can see all the light and all the color and all the creation you want to see. Whatever meditation you do or you don't do. Such is the significance of the third eye center. Now, if you like, we'll devote the rest of the time in trying to be there instead of talking about it. Because I've talked a lot about it. The time schedule is that we have a break at 12 for lunch. Is that right, Peggy? So we have half an hour. We'll do a couple of exercises. Some of you have done those exercises before. Is there anybody here who has never attended any workshop of mine or a lecture of mine? Thank you. Thank you. So we will do some preliminary exercises just to acquaint ourselves and then do some exercises which enable us to move our attention. Remember that in human consciousness or awareness, awareness is the immediate available part of consciousness. What we are now aware of is all that we know of consciousness. If we become aware of a memory, then that has come into awareness. If we don't remember, it is buried somewhere in the subconscious and so it's not part of awareness, though it is still part of consciousness. So we are using these terms awareness as that part of consciousness which we are immediately aware of, even though it may be a memory. But when we say attention, attention is that part of awareness which we can move from one segment of awareness to another. So consciousness is the totality of all possible experience, even potential experience or past experience. Consciousness is buried. Awareness comes out what is available to us now. Within awareness, we can move like a probe, our attention. We are aware of this 